Welcome to the Market Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Stalter, and in this show, we cut through the noise and give you real market insights from professional investors, traders, asset managers, and analysts. Our guests put the market developments in context and give you actionable information to make you a more successful trader or investor. Let's get started. Like every S&P 500 sector, healthcare encompasses a wide range of companies, including not only biotech, but also infotech, as well as the more familiar pharmaceuticals and medical device makers. And this is a very dynamic sector. In fact, it becomes even more dynamic when you look outside the S&P 500 and look at some of the smaller and mid-cap stocks that are also involved in health technology and healthcare today. Now, in some ways, this entire industry has come a long way in a very short time. As we discuss in today's episode, it has not been very long since medical records began to be digitized. Now, I can certainly remember a lot of paper records in hospitals and medical settings, and I also remember a revolutionary company called Athena Health that went public in 2007. And this was back when I was at Investors Business Daily, and this was a very fast-moving growth stock at the time. The company focused on making patient management and payment tracking easier for hospitals and medical practices. Now, Athena was acquired by private equity firms in 2019 and was combined with other healthcare companies. So that means you may see this newly repackaged company now being run by private equity. You may see it come back to the public markets again at some point. Not unheard of. And of course, private equity does want an exit. So that's just something that might be off in the future. But where Athena Health seemed like a unicorn in 2007, the world has changed a lot since then. And there is innovation and opportunity in all corners of health tech. So in today's episode, we get a fascinating and comprehensive glimpse of the entire health technology industry from fund manager Nina Decca. She runs the Robo Global Healthcare Technology and Innovation ETF. The ticker is HTEC. And you will want to be ready to take notes because Nina shares a number of stock ideas today and gives us her reasons why she is an investor in these companies. You don't want to miss this. I learned a lot in this conversation, and I'm sure you will too. Here is my interview with health tech fund manager, Nina Decca. So Nina, we're going to talk about healthcare today. And just broadly speaking, it's been in a slump this year after a strong performance in 2021. So I want to get us started here. Talk a little bit about what's been going on the past month or so. Was it a matter of healthcare just being swept up along with the broader market correction, or is there more to it? The combination. So there's definitely the broader market, the macro drivers, concerns about inflation, rising interest rates, and the uncertainty around the pandemic. Specific to healthcare, there are also some headwinds from the pandemic or various waves of Delta, Omicron, in that when there is a wave, it does tend to take over a lot of hospital capacity, which is already light to begin with, and limits the amount of other things that can take place in the healthcare system, like elective procedures. So you will see a pullback on stocks that are tied to procedural volume during some of the peaks. But because that is a trend that's very specific to coronavirus and the pandemic, we don't see that as a, something that really impacts these companies from a fundamental perspective. And so therefore, we believe that the underlying health of the sort of market leaders and the best in class healthcare companies is also very strong. So it's just an interesting time to look at this space. Is it typical that the healthcare sector does tend to ebb and flow with the broader market? I mean, it sounds like you're saying that the concerns about inflation that are affecting a lot of sectors aren't necessarily the driver here, or is that part of it? Well, interestingly, a lot of the things that affect healthcare from a macro perspective 
don't necessarily impact healthcare tech. And I'll explain that further. So if you look at things like changes in the White House, changes in administration, where certain healthcare priorities shift potentially from office to office, like topics like drug pricing, for example, or topics like Medicare for all was a term that was thrown around during the last election. When you have shifts in the White House, you tend to see ebbs and flows in healthcare trends. Those largely affect large cap healthcare companies like health insurance companies, large cap pharma. But when you look at healthcare tech as like as its own kind of vertical, and you could even use the HTEC ETF as a proxy for that because it's really exclusive to just healthcare tech forward companies. Those do not tend to move with those same ebbs and flows. And the reason why is because largely what we've seen in the last decade is wide bipartisan support for healthcare tech as a whole. So there is no party that's arguing that telehealth shouldn't move forward. No one is arguing that cancer should be detected earlier. Like these are themes that are here to stay and they're widely supported and they don't shift. Things like drug pricing don't necessarily impact whether or not people are going to innovate new drugs for rare diseases. So the things that do affect healthcare tech, though, from a more macro standpoint are like when people are concerned about rising interest rates, they're concerned about companies that might not yet be profitable. And how will they sustain during a rising interest rate environment, potentially when companies have to raise prices and the end buyer decides that they don't want to pay those prices and the company wasn't profitable to begin with. That's where you'll start to see some pressure on these stocks, like the tech stocks took a big hit. And when that happened, starting last year and into this year, obviously, health tech took a hit because these are all tech forward names. Right. That makes a lot of sense because growth stocks in general, which these companies you're talking about are, those were hit hard as well. Let's just jump right in and talk about some of these stocks then. I know you have a few that you would like to mention specifically. Where do you want to start here? Sure. Well, when we think about where the growth opportunity is in healthcare, and this is why we started this ETF, we wanted to be able to capture, provide exposure to investors to all this interesting growth and disruption that's happening in the healthcare environment. If we take a step back and say, well, why is there all this disruption happening? If you think about healthcare, there are a lot of problems. And I don't think anybody would argue that, right? There is a growing aging population. People over age 85 are expected to double by 2040. And that is a population that needs a lot of healthcare services. Meanwhile, healthcare skilled healthcare workers are shrinking and we don't have enough capacity. That was exacerbated during the pandemic. So we had over 100,000 people lost their lives and healthcare workers lost their lives because of COVID in the last couple of years. Over half a million in the United States alone have left their posts either from death or from burnout or doing something else for a living or Maybe their employer required a vaccination and then they didn't want to participate. But that is a huge number. And that compounds the fact that we already had a healthcare worker shortage before the pandemic. An estimated 40% of physicians in the U.S. are expected to be over age 65 in the next decade, meaning they could retire. So and half the nurses are expected to retire in the next 10 years. One out of two nurses who come into the field wind up leaving within a couple of years to go do something else for a living. So we already had a shortage, and now this is becoming compounded at an unsustainable rate. And so there are other factors. Medical error is the third leading cause of death in the United States. How do we get around all of these issues? The only way forward is with further adoption of robotics, automation, AI. And so healthcare, being that it was so undigitized, it's the last economic sector to become digitized. So given that there's so much upside up opportunity to, for digitization, that's where we're going to see these stocks flourish. And the ones that we're looking at, like in terms of data analytics, there's a company called Health Catalyst we're watching. Health Catalyst is a smaller company. A lot of people haven't heard about them. They're not in a lot of healthcare portfolios. And this company is very good at integrating with hundreds of different software programs around a hospital integrating with the lab, the electronic health record, for example. And when you can integrate with all these data sources and analyze it, you can start to look ahead into the future and say, hey, in a zip code, what patient population is at risk of becoming sick? Let's do a search. You can search by, let's say we want to see all the number of females over age 40 who have not had a mammogram in the last five years. And maybe you find a large percentage of them in a certain zip code. 
So maybe that hospital system will want to set up a campaign and try to proactively get in front of the population to conduct mammograms and breast cancer screens. That's just one example of the power of data analytics and how it can be used to reduce healthcare costs and do more with less, because that's the theme that we're going to be seeing moving forward. You know, it's interesting because as you were speaking, I thought, well, of course, because this has been done in other infotech spaces for quite some time with platforms like Salesforce.com or HubSpot. So it makes perfect sense to bring it to healthcare. Absolutely. And healthcare, like I said, just got digitized in the last 10 years with the adoption of electronic health records. Before that, everything was on paper, paper charts. You went to the doctor office, you filled out a paper chart, and it went into a file cabinet. You couldn't analyze large populations at the time. So, so data analytics is a really pot, like really promising area and the digitization of healthcare. Another really interesting area is genomics. There's just been some really cool developments like in liquid biopsy. This is where you can draw a sample of someone's blood and analyze it and find things like free floating DNA, for example, of cancer cells. If you think about a cancer tumor, it sheds cells. And so those cancer cells can be free floating in a patient's blood. And rather than doing a biopsy, which they're not going to go away, we're still going to need people to do biopsies to analyze tumor tissue, but you might be able to detect cancer sooner by drawing the patient's blood and detecting that free-floating cancer DNA. That's a really exciting development. And this early cancer detection area is something that all the genomics companies are going after. In the HTEC ETF alone, there was over $10 billion worth of M&A of companies like Illumina and Exact Sciences and Invitae going after this space. So really exciting developments happening there. And we're going to reach a point where in the next 5, 10, 20 years, by 2035, you might be able to get a prescription from a doctor to get a a blood work to get a cancer screen. So in fact, it actually already exists today. There are companies that already have things on the market like Gardent and Illumina through their acquisition of Grail. So another really cool thing in genomics is spatial biology. This is what we expect to be the next frontier in genomic science. Everybody's heard about next-gen sequencing. And when next-gen sequencing hit scale, and then the cost became lower about a, like in the last decade, the utilization took off and so did that industry. And we expect the same that's going to be happening in the next couple of years with spatial biology. And if you want, I could go a little bit deeper into what that is. It's basically the opportunity to analyze a tissue sample by keeping the integrity. So think about a fruit smoothie. You take a bunch of fruit, you grind it up, and then you can later analyze it and say, okay, I think there's raspberries in there. I think there's strawberries. I don't know how many though. But a fruit salad, you can look and see exactly which fruits are in there, how many, and exactly where everything's sitting. And the reason why that's important is because in precision medicine, there are therapies being developed to treat very specific genetic mutations. The problem is that sometimes the treatments don't work. Why don't they work? Because there might be other genes sitting nearby the genetic mutation cells within the cancer tumor that are blocking that medicine from being effective. So by having more context around what's exactly going on within the cell, within the the tissue, will help drive better and more effective therapies. This is real precision medicine. And so we are in very early days of adoption. And I think that as Companies like Akoya, ticker AKYA, also Nanostring is very involved in the spatial biology space. As companies like that continue to build scale and launch their high throughput instrumentation, we should start to see more biotech adoption, more clinical adoption over time. As a trader or investor, you need timely information to help you make better decisions. And analyst upgrades and downgrades can give you the outlook for the stocks you're watching, coming from the big institutions who are behind 75 to 80 percent of market movements. For absolutely no cost, MarketBeat will send analyst recommendations right to your inbox daily. You will get a concise summary of analyst upgrades, downgrades, and new coverage, along with relevant news and information for the stocks on your watch list, real-time portfolio monitoring tools, a rundown of the top headlines each day, 
market calendars, the Market Beat mobile app, and other research tools. Don't miss out on this. Sign up right now. It's 100% free. You'll find this at marketbeat.com slash ratings slash newsletter. That's marketbeat.com slash ratings slash newsletter, and that link will be in the show notes. Now, let me ask you this, Nina, just from a stock perspective, and thank you for that explanation, by the way, that was very understandable and really compelling in terms of the technology out there. But I'm looking at the charts for Nanostring and Akoya. I pulled those up while you were speaking. Now, these are both, let's see, Nanostring is kind of a small cap, 1.6 billion, and Akoya looks like that is, oh, even smaller, about 421 million. So is the exit for these, are these acquisition targets? You know how a lot of companies in the healthcare and tech industry, they go public with the ultimate idea of becoming an acquisition target? Or is this something that you believe might be a long-term growth play in and of itself, either one of these? My answer is both. I think the real question from an investor standpoint, I guess for us at least, what we're looking at is what is the opportunity for multiple expansion? Like, do these stocks go up over time? And one of the ways that we analyze that is, is there earnings growth potential? And they are high growth companies to begin with, but also what markets do they operate in? And then are those markets growing? And the answer to all of that is yes which makes them attractive investment opportunities, not just from an equity standpoint, but from a takeout standpoint. And as I mentioned earlier, there was over $10 billion billion of M&A in the liquid biopsy space alone in the last couple of years within our portfolio. That was all genomics companies buying up other genomics companies. So yes, absolutely, there is an opportunity for this. But even if there's not, we see them as attractive investment opportunities from a multiple expansion standpoint. And now, isn't it true that sometimes, though, in the biotech or biotech related spaces, that you might be in a kind of Hollywood blockbuster scenario that it's either hit or miss? And I understand that we are not talking about clinical drug trials in this case, but is there an element of hit or miss, or is it really more up to the adoption and how that takes place? Potentially both. And that's why when I mentioned, so the portfolio I manage is diversified for a reason. It's not a biotech strategy, right? And the reason why is because we're analyzing individual stocks to determine who are the market leaders, who are the technology leaders, who are the disruptors, and really conducting deep fundamental research to find out which companies we want to invest in. The reason why I bring that up is because In a, let's say, a pure play biotech portfolio, you're going to have what you just described, a lot of hit or misses, right? What we're looking for are which companies truly have something promising in a platform that's going to help get them there. So take Moderna, for example. We didn't invest in Moderna because of the coronavirus vaccine. We invested in Moderna because they were leading the way in mRNA research and development. They had over a dozen therapies already in the clinic before the pandemic even happened. They were looking for vaccines for RSV, HIV, CMV was a a lead candidate. And they built this state-of-the-art facility that's fully digitized, AI-enabled. They use AI through every part of their process. So when looking for biotech names that you think have something promising, we're looking at the whole story, the whole platform opportunity for them to actually fulfill an unmet need. And then when an mRNA therapy finally did get approved, now there's two on the market officially, the, it wasn't just a matter of, okay, now there's one. It was a positive catalyst for the whole industry to say, wow, mRNA really works. It's something that makes it meaningful for other investment opportunities in that space. That goes for all the biotech verticals, things across gene editing, for example, CRISPR. All it takes is for one CRISPR therapy to have success for everyone to get excited about all the other CRISPR therapies in the pipeline. So it's not just about like trying to have one of everything. It's about trying to have the companies that you think that you believe have sort of an edge that they're going to be able to get something to market and then fulfill your other question, the unmet need. Is there 10 patients in the world with this disease? Is there a million? How much is uh, money are they going to be able to charge for each drug? So there's a lot of questions that go into this play. But really, the things that we keep an eye on are the target that they're going after and also what's their platform look like. And then actually, I had something to add, too, to your question about the M&A. 
There's another data analytics company called Vocera. And Vocera, Stryker just announced that they're going to acquire Vocera. So Stryker is a med tech giant, global leader in many things. And they are looking to acquire a company in our data analytics subsector called Vocera, ticker VCRA, for over 10 times next year's sales. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And the health tech portfolio right now, our age tech portfolio is trading at five and a half times forward EV sales. So, so just to give you an example of the value perceived of the underlying stocks and yet where they're currently trading, there is a disparity. And this makes for a very attractive entry point right now in healthcare tech. Vocera would be a very interesting asset for Stryker because if you think about Stryker, they're everywhere. They are present through the, the entire patient journey the ambulance ride, the emergency room, the OR, they're present upon discharge in the patient bedside. And so Vocera brings an opportunity, what I mentioned earlier about data integration, device integration across all the different devices in the hospital. They do that among many other things, and they're going to be able to develop, deliver more efficient care. For example, less walking for nurses, better alarm management. There's a lot of alarms happening on a patient floor and people get alarm fatigue. Yep. And Vocera's data integration helps you differentiate which alarms are important and which nurse should hear which alarm. And so now Stryker, armed with this extra layer of integration and analytics is going to make them even more powerful. They didn't invent that either. They're like the fourth med tech giant in the last three years to acquire this type of asset. So we expect to see further investment in general across healthcare innovation, whether it's through upside opportunity or a takeout. And you're right. Stryker has been around forever. I remember we actually had a business school case study on Stryker. I don't remember the details. I just remember that that company was in there. I think it had to do with wheelchairs or something at the time, way back when. Possibly, or beds, surgical robotics. They've got Mako. They made another great acquisition, Mako, and that's been doing well. They are the world market leader in orthopedic robotic surgery. So yeah, it's a solid company. And so when they announced that acquisition, people were like, wow, they're going to pay 10 times for that asset. Well, yeah, it's a double digit growing asset with operating leverage um, who's closed last year with their all-time record high bookings and backlog. So when people think about like, oh, uh, healthcare, it looks like risky. These are high growth names. Yeah, sure. And they're volatile and they move a lot. However, healthcare problems are not going away overnight. And the people who I say don't get involved with healthcare innovation investing, I would say to them, don't get involved if you think healthcare is fine right now the way it is. And nobody thinks healthcare is fine the way it is. No, nobody's going to say that. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's funny. I'm looking at the time here. We have, we have a few more minutes. I know you have a few other stocks here that I want to get to. One of them is one that I know well, Intuitive Surgical, ISRG. And that is one that I remember 20 years ago, I think, Nina, as a growth stock leader, then it was kind of range bound for about five years between 2012 and 2017. And also I had a personal experience with this. I had surgery about seven years ago and I know that my surgeon used this. I was talking to her about it actually, and it was very interesting. So tell me what it is about this company that is now making a resurgence. Why is this kind of back in growth mode after it was range bound for several years? Well, they continue to innovate. So when I talk about how healthcare has to do more with less, surgical robotics is one important way to do that. And being that they are the pioneer and the world market leader in general surgery robotics, they're the ones to beat. They're the ones that everyone's going to want to chip at. They keep reinventing themselves. So they are their own technological disruptor. They're on their fourth generation of the Da Vinci. Who knows? It's only a matter of time before they announce another generation. They do so every four or five years, and we're coming up on that time. But even if they don't, they've got some other great things in the pipeline or that they've already launched. For example, general surgery is an area where they have a very strong presence, but they've recently launched ION, which is another robotic instrument that is more around bronchoscopy, so further up the anatomy. What they can do with that is help, if you think about lung cancer, it's really difficult to biopsy tumor tissue for lung cancer. It's just really hard to reach places. And when you do the biopsy, it's hard to know if you got the right sort of part of the the tissue to make an accurate diagnosis. So they are showing studies that are showing that they're able to dramatically improve 
the sample that is retrieved using the robot. It's able to get into those hard to reach places that human hands have a tough time getting into. And with that earlier diagnosis, they can help save lives. To give you some reference, there's about a five-year survival rate for all stages of prostate cancer. It's about 98%, and that's risen from 66% in 1975. But the five-year average survival rate for lung cancer at all stages is about 18%. So there is a huge disparity, and earlier definitive diagnosis can help close that gap, and that's something that Intuitive is going after. So when you think about like what's the upside here, it's, well, one due to the stock having come in, this is a great opportunity for anybody who's wanted to get involved in the name for a long time, but also they just keep reinventing themselves and there's a lot more that they can do with this. Yeah, that's really exciting. Let me ask you about one more enabling technology. That's an area where you're invested. What is that? And what's a stock that might come from that industry? Sure. We think about like a lot of the cool technology I discussed. There's a lot of people say when you go after the gold rush, you want to also make sure to invest in the picks and the shovels. And so that's like a bucket we call process automation. These are the enablers of all the other cool stuff I just talked about. And so there's when I give you when I talked about Moderna earlier, they would not have been able to get the hundreds of millions of doses across the finish line had it not been for the partnership of some of these companies, these outsourced third parties companies. They partnered with a company called Lanza and another one called Catalant. These are both in the HTech portfolio, by the way, but Catalant's particularly interesting because they created a whole manufacturing line and have become a subject matter expert on mRNA manufacturing. So when I mentioned earlier that now that there's an mRNA drug on the market, a couple of them, that people are going to get really excited about all the other potential mRNA therapies, well, they're going to need to partner with someone to help them manufacture all these drugs and get them out the door. If you look at, I mentioned Moderna's got a state-of-the-art facility. Most biotech startups do not have one. So when they go to put a drug in a clinical trial, they need to find a partner to help them manufacture that drug put it in a pill form or in an injectable format, and you need a company to help you do that. Catalan has gone all in on these very specialized biotech type of therapeutics, the small batch quantities. These are areas that a lot of the large contract development manufacturing companies don't want to get involved in. But Catalan is invested in heavily in it, and they're able to help with these gene therapies and other smaller batch very specialized therapies, as well as the large batch ones, like the mRNA vaccine that's now in hundreds of millions of arms around the world. And this really, I'm looking at the chart again, and it's kind of gone along with the market downturn in recent months. But even so, just looking at this, ever since bouncing back after that initial pandemic decline, this one really has been on a tear, hasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they keep reporting beats and raises, and it's particularly in this biologics division of theirs where they've invested heavily to be the premier manufacturer of helping all these biotech companies with their highly specialized drugs. Yeah. In a weird way, it reminds me of the co-packers in the food industry. It's almost like a similar concept, you know? Yeah. Some of these companies are also involved in that. Codex is another contract development manufacturing organization they specialize in exactly that. And they have companies in the food industry as clients of theirs. They partner with Nestle. But yeah, you're right. There are ways to leverage scale, not just in therapeutics, but in other sectors as well. Oh, that's fascinating. Hey, Nina, thank you so much for joining the show today. This is, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have and got a lot of great ideas for stocks to research Tell the listeners how they can learn more about your fund and what you're doing. Sure. Check us out at roboglobal.com. And this is one way to be able to capture all the innovation that I just discussed in the healthcare subsectors. There are nine different subsectors in the HTEC ETF, the tickers HTEC, H-T-E-C. And feel free to reach out if anyone has any questions. That's great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining the show today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate your interest. All right. That's a wrap on this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. You'll find the show on all your favorite podcast apps, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Apple Podcasts, of course, anywhere else you get your podcasts. And you can always find us on marketbeat.com. 
And please, if you're enjoying the timely market insights we're bringing you each week and finding them valuable, please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That will help others find the show so we can bring these investing ideas to an even wider audience. Thank you.